So welcome very much, everybody. Swayne again, you. Um, delighted to have you here with us today, and very pleased to have uh, introductions today that are going to be given by Nick Rodrigo, who is going to introduce our special guest, Michael Bryant. Uh, Nick is a partner at uh, Davies Ward Phillips and Weinberg, where Montreal is a litigation firms. He specializes in class action security legislation, uh, security litigation. And uh, commercial and corporate litigation, and we're thrilled to have Davies support here uh, today uh, as part. It's not going to do it, but this is on you. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say how happy I am on behalf of the firm to be sponsoring this event. I think one of the reasons why they probably asked me to uh, give some opening remarks is I chair the um, pro bono committee for the firm. Uh, and indeed, one of the things that we're working towards at the firm, in, in addition to sort of doing the um, widows and orphans and hopeless cases kinds of litigation, is uh, focusing a bit more on general public interest litigation within our pro bono program. And we've had a lot of success recently with a couple of files that we're very proud of um, here out of the Montreal office uh, of Davies. Um, acting for EGAL Canada, which is a group that uh, 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 lobbies for uh, LGBTQ rights uh, across Canada. Um, and we managed to get a few sections of the Civil Code of Quebec, the new Civil Code uh, amended recently, struck down for uh, discrimination against uh, same-sex couples, transgender individuals, um, having to do with parental naming rights and things like that, oh, which we're very pleased about. We're also actively involved in uh, the Bill 21 litigation, acting for the World Sikh Organization, uh, which is a group that I mean, seeks around the world, as you may guess, that approached us to act to uh, participate in the constitutional challenge of the uh, Bill 21, the uh, religious uh, symbols legislation. Uh, in Quebec. And that is a struggle that is ongoing. Uh, partial success, I suppose we would call it. Um, and uh, I think the final chapter on that story very much has yet to be written, um, but we're also very proud of our involvement in that. And those are the sorts of things we'd really like to try to do more of in the next few years. Our Toronto office has had a long association with the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. And uh, with that in mind, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Michael Bryant, former uh, Attorney General of Ontario and with the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Uh, take the word. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Look at that. What timing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am uh, very grateful to be here. I'm honored to be here. Uh, Thank you uh, to uh, Davies Philip Weinberg for uh, um, thank you uh, as well um, uh, to, uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Uh, I am the father of a uh, third generation McGill student. Uh, her grandmother, um, uh, Arlene Abramovich, uh, has degrees from McGill in social work, uh, including a graduate degree. Um, her mom, uh, Susan Abramovich, uh, has got a couple of gold medals, and uh, uh, she's on, in a wall somewhere around the corner from me. Um, believe me, she swung the two gold medals at my meager silver medal from, uh, from Osgood. And, um, and then my daughter, whose name will not be mentioned under strict orders, a publication ban on all uh, children's identification. Uh, she's a, a second student here at McGill uh, doing cultural studies. Uh, this is as close as I'm going to get to being a McGill student. Um, I'm not worthy, um, but I'm still grateful to be here. Uh, having lured you into the talk, I should begin by lowering expectations and saying that the research uh, on this front is it, it, it's, it's somewhat, lawyers are, are in a similar position uh, I suppose, as those who work in public health, uh, those who work in public health, uh, pursuant to the precautionary principle of public health, uh, will uh, will say when dealing with the pandemic, we need to proceed um, with inadequate information sometimes, uh, and that uh, and that approach, uh, while contrary to the ordinary uh, scientific method, uh, is based on the speed in which the virus spreads. Similarly, uh, lawyers assessing the laws uh, to deal with the pandemic are often dealing with inadequate information. And uh, in that sense, we're in the same boat and we're correcting as we go along. Uh, so my res our research that we're going to use here today 
uh, is preliminary, but um, I, I think that the, um, the punchline to this, the main fact uh, that um, uh, I'll leave you in suspense on uh, is irrefutable. Uh, I believe that the um, judicial branch has been the runt of the constitutional litter in Canada uh, during COVID-19 uh, with little to no impact uh, on the hundreds of executive orders passed across the country. Um, yes, there have been, there's been some uh, rulings from some courts across the country, uh, but that in terms of providing a, a general direction uh, to legislators and the executive, nothing like what has taken place uh, south of the border. Uh, it is also true that the rule of law suffered in the un uneven and failed capacity of many jurisdictions to publish new laws in a timely fashion. And when I say publish, I mean to, to disclose or make available to the public. Uh, it was not unusual, it has not been unusual during COVID for a new executive order to pass after its effect was announced by the government as if it had already been authorized. The risk of a destabilizing crisis arises from such contempt for the Constitution and the rule of law. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to spend a word on CCLA, I'm going to talk about public interest litigation in Canada during COVID, the rule of law problems and the need for a postmortem. Uh, I believe it's contemptuous of uh, executives uh, to presume that an executive council may amend or decide against approval of a regulation. Uh, in other words, when uh, a member of parliament, a uh, member of the National Assembly and the legislature speaks of a law that is before that legislature, uh, it is unparliamentary and contemptuous of the legislature to say, this is what this law is going to do when it passes in a month because we have a majority and we get our way. Uh, it's contemptuous because it presumes that there won't be uh, something that intervenes to um, create a different law or amend the law, or maybe the law doesn't pass. Now, more often than not, majority laws, um, majority governments do see their legislation pass. But I can say as a former government house leader and uh, someone who was in the legislature for 10 years, uh, you don't know what's going to happen to a particular law. It might change. There might be an amendment. Uh, parliament may uh, fold. Uh, there may be an adjournment. The bill may die on the order paper. It happens. Uh, and uh, the, But the main reason for, for not presuming to know what the law is going to be is because, of course, we can't presume to know the future. And for a government to represent this is what the law is or will be when it hasn't received its approval uh, is contemptuous of the legislature, literally. <clears throat> We've never applied that. Uh, contempt um, label to regulations and orders in council because quite simply up until COVID whenever there would be an order in council or a regulation passed usually it would come into effect in the, in the what we now consider during COVID to be the distant future you know two weeks from now or a month from now uh, or six months from now and uh, usually by the time the regulation passed, uh, it was available in whatever form, either on a website or otherwise. Uh, and the fact that there was a delay between the moment of passage of the order and the publication of that order uh, was neither here nor there pre-pandemic. Uh, During the pandemic, it, unfortunately, the old system remained by and large. Uh, there were delays, and most alarmingly and concerning to, from my perspective, laws were allegedly authorized uh, by cabinet um, without them being disclosed. They were set to go into effect, and we just had to take the word of the first minister of the day when the first minister uh, or the minister of health said, this is the new law. Um, General counsel, uh, counsel to particularly the airline industry uh, in January passed when 
The new rules were to come into effect in January, put into place by the federal government. Uh, we, we had law firms calling us up and asking if we had a copy of the order of counsel because they had to advise their clients, the airlines, as to what the law was. Uh, usually, uh, the response from government was, well, we put out a communication package. You heard from the prime minister. You have uh, your direction. Uh, lawyers would have something else to say about that. We'd say, well, we don't uh, we may have a communication package, but we're interested in what the law is, not what it might be, and not what you think it is. We want to read what the law is. Uh, it, it, was, it became typical during COVID in most provinces for there to be um, a, a dark zone um, of ignorance during which a law was supposedly in effect, uh, but it had not been published. Uh, this was true in the province of Quebec. This was true in, in Ontario and in British Columbia. And unfortunately, it was true for the federal government as well. Now, uh, ministers of justice like uh, McGill's own David Lametti did try to um, improve on the situation, uh, but uh, not to the point where you, it was the case in Atlantic provinces, where usually when a new uh, direction was given, a new order was given, uh, the Atlantic provinces would just attach the order and council to the press release. Very helpful. Um, I understand the law needs to go off to the lieutenant governor or to the governor general before it becomes a law, but uh, in this age where we've got telephones which uh, can take uh, a picture uh, of the new order and council, there's no reason why this couldn't have been published in real time. I uh, do think that as well, the rule of law was compromised um, by way of uh, the delays and inability to access justice to the point where uh, public interest litigation in Canada uh, was truly paltry during COVID-19 and far from what it ought to have been. Uh, compared to the rest of the world during the pandemic, uh, sorry, pre-pandemic compared to the rest of the world, Canada is less litigious than most uh, G20 countries. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, judicial review was a rarity, considering the hundreds and hundreds of executive orders and orders in council that were passed uh, during this time. And um, compared to the United States, uh, Canada operated during the pandemic as if it were without a judicial branch to check and balance government excesses, such as uh, Montreal's curfew, particularly in the later stages, such as provincial border patrols, uh, the latest federal workplace regulations, uh, Alberta's Henry VIII clause, and Toronto's prohibition on park bench recreating. Uh, uh, be that as it may, uh, once you've seen the preliminary research regarding judicial review, uh, you may come to the conclusion that my talk is an overstatement uh, based upon uh, the particular perspective that you take generally on the management of the pandemic. Uh, I will say, uh, without getting into that, um, and I, I would categorize the two camps because we can't say left and right anymore, when it comes to the pandemic, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union, the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association, and uh, I think it's fair to say federally in Canada and in the United States, as well as in the state of California, are taking what you could call uh, to be a pro-precautionary approach. Uh, ACLU came out in favor of vaccine mandates, vaccine passports. Uh, on the other side of the equation are those who are, I'm going to say, precautionary skeptics. Uh, both despair of the other, as we all know. Uh, you don't have to be in one camp or the other to uh, take a position on uh, the state of public pandemic litigation. Uh, you don't have to either agree with a skeptic or disagree with a skeptic. Uh, as it uh, says, uh, the person who claims uh, 
that CCLA uh, is independent on these issues. We haven't, for example, come out and said we're, we, we presume vaccine passports to be presumptively unconstitutional, nor have we come out like the ACLU saying that they're presumptively constitutional. Uh, it, from our perspective, it really does depend on the way in which the law is written enough on what could be called the politics of uh, governing a, a pandemic. Uh, so rule of law problem uh, number one. Uh, and can I get you to skip ahead a few? Um, keep going. Here we go. Uh, let's, let's stop right there. So uh, rule of law problem number one is, well, we have a rule of law. Uh, it's mentioned in the Constitution. We know it's entrenched in Section 1 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, and uh, the rule of law has uh, democratic aspects to it. Obviously, it's, it's part of the uh, checks and balances. It, it involves uh, principles of certainty. I, I'm not here to give you a lecture on the rule of law, other than to say that the, the rule of law requires a law uh, and under our constitution, it requires a, um, a law that has been prescribed. In other words, a, a positive law, written law, so uh, not a, a principle, an unwritten principle, or an unwritten constitutional principle, uh, but rather something that had been prescribed by law. Uh, and secondly, under the charter, and this has not been the case during the pandemic, rightly or wrongly, uh, secondly, uh, until the pandemic, uh, the way that Section 1 of the Charter writes, the Reasonable Limitation Clause, but it's also really the main provision of the Charter, Section 1, uh, is this requirement that the Crown has to demonstrably justify any limitation on rights. And demonstrably justified in modern constitutional litigation, that meant evidence. Uh, demonstrable justification involves some empirical evidence to justify the limitation. Not so during uh, the pandemic. Why? Well, the precautionary public health approach by design uh, operates without adequate information. The idea being that by the time we have demonstrable justification, uh, the pandemic may have gotten out of control, people may have died, it's an emergency, we have, we have to operate notwithstanding that. Now, we don't have a constitutional doctrine that I'm aware of to manage this phenomenon. The way that it came up, practically speaking, in uh, one of the cases that CCLA had uh, in Newfoundland, in an excellent judgment that we, we did not succeed in the application, but it is on appeal, and on the first branch, we did succeed. It was a mobility rights case, and we were challenging the provincial border restrictions in Newfoundland. The, um, uh, the, the court ruled uh, that there was some evidence provided by the Crown. It was the chief medical officer who said, uh, yes, uh, we thought that it was possible if we stopped people from coming into the province that it might uh, have a positive impact on restricting the virus. So it's, you might say that's just a rational connection, but that was enough for the court. But, but what, what the case turned on was the fact that the court said that the applicant, uh, not the crown, not the state, but the applicant, the, the party in this case challenging the law, did not have any evidence. We didn't, we didn't show up with empirical evidence to show to the contrary that this was not going to have a public health impact. Now, under uh, charter jurisprudence until the pandemic came along, uh, the, the, the party challenging uh, the law uh, was not obliged. There was no um, obligation on that party to bring forth evidence. Uh, it was ideal if you had it, but in our case, we didn't. Uh, which is a, a broader phenomenon that I mentioned because we're talking about pandemic litigation. Uh, getting a, finding an epidemiologist to publicly come out and in any way, poke holes in or criticize what the uh, province or the federal government was doing was as difficult in my experience as finding a technologist to testify against Google, uh, which was our experience when we uh, brought the Keysight uh, litigation. Uh, every technologist and their uh, second kin uh, 
at one point in their careers was a Google scholar and felt that they were conflicted out and, uh, and therefore it was very difficult to find a technologist. So too, during the pandemic, I'll just say uh, our experience was very difficult to find any expert witnesses, any forensic scientists, uh, any uh, professor or otherwise who would uh, come forth and provide evidence uh, contrary to the Crown. Um, with respect to um, the rule of law problem number one, however, the concern was less with the operation of section one and more with the absence of a law at all. Um, so why don't we just um, flip forward? Um, we can pass through there. That's what an order of council looks like. Um, this is my uh, dramatic representation of uh, two first ministers uh, uh, governing by podium as opposed to by law. Now, the way in which orders and council come about and regulations come about, that's probably another talk in another class. But let me tell you that in the provinces of Quebec and Ontario, uh, you can get an order and council passed with five people. And sometimes what will happen with a cabinet minister is you, there's a knock on your door at home and you will be, um, you come to the door and there's the cabinet secretary uh, standing there with a, uh, with a billfold saying, sign here. Uh, and that's how the law is passed. Now, uh, to be fair, when I was attorney general, I would read it. Uh, if I thought I had to, I would call in to the ministry to see if they had something to say about it. But uh, the level of scrutiny that goes into some of these uh, orders in council is particularly during COVID, I'm sure, people were just signing there when they were told to sign there. Maybe not in the first two weeks, but given the volume, um, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if they were electronic signatures being used. Um, so why don't we then go ahead to uh, rule of law problem number two. This is really the only thing you need to see uh, in this talk. Uh, in uh, Canada, we have no matters on the docket at the Supreme Court of Canada involving a challenge to a COVID law, zero. There have been zero judgments and there are zero appeals awaiting consideration, whether they be interlocutory or otherwise by the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, in the first uh, month of the pandemic in Israel, the uh, prime minister declared uh, that uh, infected COVID Israelis would have their cell phones monitored by the secret service uh, and that they were authorized to do so. Uh, within a month of that order coming down from the prime minister, the high, the Supreme Court of Israel sitting as the high court ruled that in fact, the order was ultra virus within a month. So there is a country where you can get a result between the passage of an order, consideration, the filing of all the materials and a ruling within a month. Uh, in the United States, in May of 2020, the US Supreme Court handed down its first decision on COVID was uh, South Bay United Pentecostal Church versus Newsom. It involved an order passed by the governor uh, on May 7th. All the materials ended up before uh, the US Supreme Court by May 29, and a decision was rendered that day. Uh, so uh, again, uh, in that case, within three weeks of the decision from the, from the governor, the US Supreme Court was able to render a judgment. In fact, the US Supreme Court rendered, has rendered 21 judgments during COVID, some involving interlocutory matters that are only done in writing, some involving full-fledged uh, uh, appeals from uh, the various circuits or county courts. Uh, Canada, as I said, had zero. Um, in fact, uh, Canada has only one matter 
that we are aware of um, on its way to the Supreme Court. And it's a matter that I referenced uh, Newfoundland. We're appearing before the um, Newfoundland Court of Appeal before the end of the year. We brought that matter in the first place in June of last year. Uh, it is now it is now a year and a half later, and we're about to be considered by the Newfoundland Court of Appeal. I don't want to be presumptuous of what we will do and whether or not we will appeal it if we get the wrong result. Uh, but I suppose it's possible that matter could go to the Supreme Court of Canada in uh, 2022, which would make it the first matter to go to that court. Can we go to the next slide? So here have been the Canadian uh, cases that have gone to courts. Uh, that number is not zero, but uh, the appellate treatment is zero. We've not had any appeals uh, rendered. And while we have our materials filed in the Newfoundland Court of Appeal, we haven't had an oral argument yet. Uh, so zero appeals uh, to date. Uh, what does that mean? Well, there is no uh, independent voice from the judiciary guiding governments across Canada on the management of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and or human rights codes on the one hand and uh, emergency management on the other. None. No court of appeal anywhere in this country. Nothing from the Supreme Court of Canada and nothing to come from the Supreme Court of Canada. That said, there has been uh, efforts in 29 cases. Uh, it looks like the Quebec curfew tops the list. Six uh, challenges at the first instant to the curfew. So kudos to uh, the public interest litigants in Quebec for, for that. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, there's um, been some litigation uh, that has been undertaken, but nothing that's uh, uh, touched uh, courts of appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada. And in that sense, while it has impacted on an individual basis, some laws, uh, CCLA succeeded uh, with the city of Toronto uh, having a change to the way shelters operated during COVID. That was positive uh, that that changed. Um, would that eventually have changed? I, I believe it would have eventually changed. Did that impact other laws? It's difficult for me to see how it did or would. Um, and certainly there's no doctrine guiding attorneys general or departments of justice coming out of the Supreme Court of Canada or the Court of Appeal that would allow government to say, okay, here's how we uh, manage uh, these laws within the constitution. Um, the other, um, oh, sorry, let's go to the next slide and then we'll see what the US Supreme Court uh, has uh, done with uh, what the issues have been. You can see um, uh, execution of an inmate infected with COVID-19. Well, that would be a uniquely US appeal. Uh, the death penalty not existing in most G20 uh, democracies. And um, so uh, having COVID, uh, and being executed is going to be unique to the United States, but the point being that it was considered by that court and the decision was made. Uh, the issues uh, covered by the US Supreme Court, similar to the ones covered uh, in Canada at first instance, but again, that justice system was operating in a way that somehow uh, the US Supreme Court, uh, between the litigants and the court services and the procedures and the institutions were able to rule on this to the point where it is now clear what the limitations are, for example, um, when it comes to accommodating religious freedoms and putting limitations in place on gatherings of people in uh, places of worship. Uh, it, there is some guidance. You might not agree with it. Uh, I understand that. Uh, however, uh, it, it is, you can say what the law is in the United States in some of these areas with respect to uh, public health protocols and prisons and the other issues that are up there uh, on that slide. So enough, I better be quiet and take some questions now. Uh, what, what's the, um, what's the, uh, the problem with this? 
Well, I'll tell you one problem is that the constitutional issues become an afterthought and uh, uh, sort of an, an irrelevant annoyance. Uh, the mayor of Toronto, who I respect and um, I served with him in the legislature, I've got a lot of time for John Tory. When we brought our challenge against the city of Toronto on shelters, uh, this is what he said. I think things like this lawsuit, they're not helpful. It's unproductive because it takes time away from city staff actually responding to this crisis to instead write legal memos. So that's pretty good spin, uh, but it's crazy talk because uh, the city of Toronto retained a law firm uh, to conduct uh, its response to our application. They didn't pull nurses out of um, uh, emergency wards to write their factums. Uh, that was done by lawyers. But uh, I don't think you could get away with that in the United States. I don't think you could. I don't think you could say, "Oh, the Constitution is irrelevant. These court matters are just a distraction, and they're not productive." Uh, now, I might be wrong, uh, but that attitude, uh, that spin, is—I mean—that's an approach. Like, uh, don't talk to me about the Constitution, you know. And this was a line from. Uh, this was something that the Prime Minister in. Uh, not the prime minister, rather, but uh, a, um, uh, a premier said in, uh, in Australia, don't talk to me about um, the constitution. Uh, we've got body bags in the streets. Uh, this is a rhetorical argument uh, and, uh, and one that maybe makes sense in that state, but one that I, uh, I don't think belongs in Canada. Uh, prescription, here it is, it's just leadership but it requires leadership from many sources, from the Academy, from McGill, unquestionably. Uh, the concerns and the reform needed for the way in which executive business gets done in Quebec and across Canada, this is the subject uh, and ought to be the subject of scrutiny by the law school and by the university uh, that is as committed to the rule of law as I know it is. Leadership from the bar, it requires matters to be brought before the courts, like uh, publicly interested law firms like Davies. Uh, it does, and they do. Uh, it obviously requires uh, as well leadership uh, in legislatures and the government. Uh, McGill's own David Lametti is probably our best hope at uh, it, it, taking his uh, passion and interest and concern for the rule of law uh, from his uh, academic past into his uh, political present. Uh, and, you know, we're going to need uh, amendments, changes made to this system. It is not sustainable going forward that we're not going to know what the law is when it's purported to be something other than what's up on a website or otherwise published to the public. We, we can't continue to operate as we have been. It's just not sustainable uh, that we wouldn't know what the law is uh, based upon the principles of certainty with respect to the rule of law. Um, uh, thank you uh, for your time. Uh, thanks for uh, having me here and I look forward to any questions you have. Thanks very much, Michael. So I think, uh, so I've been asked to give a couple of words about the center and a couple of words about um, uh, what the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism does very much in the vein that Michael just shared in terms of creating a academic forum with these types of discussions can take place. Uh, certainly in the context of um, the, the center itself, it does provide this broad and multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary space where these kinds of debates can take place, looking at uh, multiple uh, from multiple perspectives. Um, in the context of the of the pandemic, and Michael, thanks very much for for your remarks. Just a, a couple of uh, reflections and, and thoughts, so listening to what you had to say. Um, one of them is certainly from the Quebec perspective. Uh, there was a huge amount of activity in terms of both directives and orders of council. Of course, uh, shortly after the the, uh, the pandemic was proclaimed, uh, we did a rough count uh, working with the researcher here between uh, March and uh, the end of September. 
2020, there were more than 170 orders in council and ministerial directors that were issued. Fairness, most of them were the repeats that were required because of the built-in sunsets. But nonetheless, uh, there was an enormous amount of activity. Now, in the Quebec context, these were all or mostly uh, authorized under the, uh, the Public Health Act. The Public Health Act has a specific provision that says that when a state of emergency is declared, uh, that the usual rules do not apply, uh, and that these types of emergency forms of regulation can take place. So from a Quebec perspective, I think it's pretty clear that most courts would decide that it was indeed prescribed by law. Uh, I think the more interesting question, uh, and, and the other thing that Quebec did, I think, right, uh, and it, it's interesting to hear the differences with Ontario, uh, was that the, the orders and council and directors were immediately placed on the government measures website, literally as they were waiting for them to be published in the Gazette. So there was immediate access to the exact terms, in some cases amended by hand, as of course you'll see uh, in the legislature itself or the National Assembly itself. Uh, but what was missing, of course, was that whole legislative process. And it very much was uh, government by fiat. We very much saw this process happening in other countries that were using the, the coronavirus as a bit of a fig leaf, uh, coronavirus coups, if I could use the term the Los Angeles Times used many years ago, uh, many months ago, rather. Um, and, and this idea that you could actually use the pandemic as a pretext to grab executive control. And I think that's one of the things that uh, groups like the CCLA and others have been uh, very careful about is to make sure that at the time that you need constitutions and bills of rights the most, which of course is in times of emergency because that's when they're most likely to be flooded, uh, that's when you actually need that level of scrutiny and that is actually when you need that level of, of uh, examination of what governments are doing, making sure the rule of law is in place. Uh, and that there are accountability mechanisms that are established relatively early on to make sure that governments are held to account given the relative silence or quiescence of the judiciary. It doesn't bother me a whole lot, frankly, that we are less litigious than the United States. Um, uh, you know, different jurisdictions deal with these issues differently. Uh, but I, I, I do think it's a worry uh, that the judiciary in Canada was much more prone, if you will, was much more quiescent, was much less likely to look critically uh, at some of these uh, issues and concerns than may have been the case in other jurisdictions. The Israeli jurisdiction I think is a really, really interesting one. Um, in the Canadian context, of course, we did have the successful litigation against the curfew. Michael made reference to it. Uh, the mobile legal clinic here in Montreal did terrific work in dealing with uh, the impossibility uh, of homeless people to be able to respect the curfew for obvious reasons, given that they were homeless. It seemed like a slam dunk in an obvious case, and it was frankly absurd uh, that the government of Quebec and, and Mr. Legault refused uh, to entertain uh, withdrawing the, the relevant order in council uh, in the face of such overwhelming evidence with regard to the possibility to comply. And the broader issues around uh, the sort of de facto criminalization uh, uh, of uh, people who were subject to vagrancy laws, people who were in the streets and so on, is obviously, is obviously a, a real concern. Um, the, one of the things that Amnesty International uh, and others brought to the fore as the pandemic moved through was looking at alternative accountability structures, uh, given that we were living in times when governments were not functioning, or certainly legislatures were not functioning uh, as they're supposed to do. Um, and one of the things that they advised was setting up some form of a accountability council or some form of a group that would engage with civil society so you could have built-in accountability structures that would automatically kick into place uh, once these types of emergencies were declared. Um, it is interesting, I think, that given the upheaval in our lives, that all of these measures were put into place with no constitutional change, uh, with no legislative change, uh, and with nothing other than uh, a reversal of the normal role, if you will, that civil and political rights play on the one hand, uh, and that uh, economic, social, and cultural rights play on the other. And it was simply assumed that the general welfare concerns would immediately prevail over all other legal concerns. So I think that was a really interesting phenomenon that took place without a whole lot of discussion until we were well into uh, well into the pandemic. Um, so uh, 
we're going to pass before we go to questions. I just wonder if Michael, do you have any official thoughts or responses to any of what I just said before we move on? Uh, no, I thought that was quite helpful. I, I was interested that you're not concerned with the lack. Well, it's not so much that there's a, an absence of uh, public interest litigation in the first instance. There was some. Uh, I apologize. There was some uh, in you know across Canada, not as much as other jurisdictions, but in any event, there was some. Um, uh, but you know because uh, but but that there's zero matters that ended up in an appeal court or in the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, from my perspective, as a uh, someone who's litigating, I, I mean, no question, some of that was driven, that had an impact on breaking litigation in the first place. So we we knew that, um, as you say, because there was this general deference, um, with some exceptions, and the curfew matters were exceptions, and we did get a good result in Toronto through just with Justice Sauston, but. Uh, by and large, um, certainly the injunctions that were brought were just uh, all, I, all the injunctions, as far as I know, failed uh, outside of Quebec. Um, so you knew that the, the likelihood of a provincial uh, of an injunction failing uh, in your province was high, and and you weren't going to get that wasn't going to change because we weren't going to get something from the Court of Appeal to change it. We certainly weren't going to get something from the Supreme Court of Canada to shift in some way this deference, and not shift it from deference to strict scrutiny, but maybe we'd get a formula that, that is beyond just, well, we're in a pandemic and governments shouldn't be expected to demonstrably justify. So I, 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 I think that the impact of that the absence, not lack of, but the complete absence of appellate jurisprudence is it was problematic for that reason. Yeah, and, and if I could just perhaps uh, respond to that very quickly. Uh, one of the issues in Quebec was the type of initial litigation that was brought. Mm -hmm. So so I, I think the reaction of bringing broad-based challenges to the entire regulatory structure without a specific complaint in mm -hmm. mind and just simply saying it's unacceptable that I can't leave my house or it's unacceptable right. that I can't, which was actually one of the arguments that was brought was a strategic error. Um, what worked in the mobile legal clinic case was a specific uh, set of circumstances that were highly tailored to the circumstances and had they lost or had the government appealed, no doubt would have gone to the appellate court. And I think the government knew better than to even bother, bother to try. It does seem to me, though, that where there was a lack of uh, focus from the litigation community in Quebec was really around implementation. Uh, police often didn't know what was going on. We're not in a position to, in, I, I spoke to some police about this, often we're not trained or mm -hmm. given any information on the laws or the regulations they were supposed to impact. And, and uh, I want to close with a comment about the bar. Um, I was president of Quebec's Human Rights, uh, the, the Quebec Bar Association's Human Rights Committee for uh, more years than I care to count. And it was, uh, it was, it was disappointing that the Quebec Bar Association did not issue a single statement mm -hmm. uh, challenging uh, any aspect of any of the rules that were put in place, notwithstanding concerns uh, that were raised. So the other, the thing I find more concerning in a sense is that the bar itself uh, was not taking any of those positions or expressing any of those concerns. So perhaps with that in mind, I wonder if there's any mm -hmm. questions being raised uh, in chat or, Yeah. Time to be a question. Thank you so much for coming in today. Um, I'm wondering now, post facto, a year and a half in from the original uh, regulations and executive orders that law enforcement and police enforced and handed out thousands of dollars of, of fines to individuals. I'm wondering now that you know it's been shown that there isn't an appetite to challenge those regulations or executive orders at the top level. How can individuals, you know, you know, uh, try and come back those fines and try and get out of those fines or to the system itself? Or is that going to be a situation where the courts will be kind of flowed with those challenges and they're going to say, you know, president of one and they're all going to be legal or are they going to take it by case by case basis? Or do you think that given the culture of non uh, kind of litigation of those emergency measures, 
it's just going to be a, a pain and, and kind of walk away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to hear from you on this one as well, but I, I, let me just take a stab at that. It's a great question. So we, uh, firstly, I, I, I wish that it's not too late that um, some amnesties might be granted, at least for some particular provisions, which in hindsight, uh, a city or province would say, or territory would say, um, yeah, that, um, that we overdid that, uh, or we, we, we found out that the bylaw officers enforcing that particular provision uh, did not exercise any discretion and basically took a zero tolerance approach. Uh, so some version of uh, an amnesty can be brought into effect either through provincial prosecutors or municipal prosecutors uh, or through crowns, depending on what the uh, crown attorneys, depending on what the jurisdiction is. Uh, so that is open. Secondly, you know, it is up, it would be up to the bar uh, and uh, legal aid systems to provide assistance to people uh, who, and they did, uh, face in the investigation and the laying of the charge uh, and it, the same biases as existed pre-pandemic. So, uh, of course, you know, if you have racial profiling taking place pre-pandemic, you're going to have racial profiling taking place during the pandemic. And sure enough, uh, no surprise, uh, we were getting reports of um, Black, Indigenous, people of color uh, walking through Ottawa Park, uh, being stopped um, and uh, asked for their identification and you know, it basically a stop and frisk, a, a carding um, uh, because of the color of their skin. And that's why. Uh, so uh, again, um, the, uh, this, we have anecdotal evidence, but that's all we have. Uh, that is something where the bar would need to intervene. And then the, just the last comment would be uh, with respect to that, that everything we say about the criminalization of poverty and the criminalization of mental illness and the criminalization of addiction that again, existed outside of the pandemic absolutely applies to the pandemic. And, uh, eventually, uh, most governments in Canada be began to see that, um, that punishing the homeless for being homeless uh, was wrong. Uh, but it took some time and it took uh, before that would uh, have happened if it has happened in Quebec, but certainly as a result of the efforts in court, it did happen. Uh, but the um, effect of it, uh, and the impact of these fines and the hearing of them uh, involved something that, you know, I think took place after 9-11 as well, but quite starkly. Uh, and, and I think we all felt this happening. We couldn't find, pick the day in which it happened, but this has always been a, about a virus. It's a public health crisis involving the transmission of a virus. It's not a zombie apocalypse. So we don't have people turning into zombies, which would create a public order crisis. We don't. But at some point, this public health crisis became a public order crisis. Uh, and I think people were imagining, you know, wild um, uh, raves taking place uh, in downtown Montreal. And it just, it just wasn't the case. It, it was literally a product of, of a political imagination that um, in Toronto, uh, there would be, uh, there were bylaw officers sent out in a sweep and a crackdown of what? Uh, of public disorder. Uh, again, um, all of the surveillance focused on people um, missed the, the point of the crisis. Since we couldn't surveil the virus, uh, we haven't been able to surveil the virus yet. Uh, to surveil people became the next best thing. But it, it, it really involved a leap of logic to imagine that we had a public order crisis because we, we never did have a public order crisis. We only had a public health crisis. And that, whenever that happens, it's always 
fear-based. It's not science-based. It's not empirical. It's just fear-based. And certainly that happened over time and arguably is still happening today. It's just, it's now happening in employment law and around mandates uh, as opposed to um, park benches where you were not allowed to sit if you were recreating in Toronto. Uh, but what, what, what are your thoughts on this? I just really like the use of the term recreating as a verb. I just want to start with that. Um, so so uh, maybe just a couple of reflections. Uh, one of them is that the, uh, I don't think the issue is so much, you know, the sheer number of fines that have been issued as a sort of global <clears throat> concern. I think the context, again, is how the fines were issued and the context in which they were issued and the proportionality of them, right? Michael had uh, section one of the, of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms up on the board. It is a matter of international law. Uh, the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, has an Article 4, very clear sort of set of guidelines around how you handle threats to uh, national, national threats. They're not actually described as existential threats or as military threats. It can really can be any kind of threat. And this idea of how you respond in proportion to the threat is really fundamental in international law, of course, just as in the Center for Canadian Charter Rights and Freedoms. So, so the, I think the question comes back to this issue of proportionality uh, and, and capacity to, to respond to and respect the regulations. The case of homelessness, again, is the obvious one. Uh, but also, you know, uh, disproportionate impact on Indigenous people, disproportionate impact on racialized people, as Michael said, very well documented throughout the, the uh, pandemic, and I think does form an empirical basis, actually, on which, on which these things can be, can be litigated. I, I, I do think at the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, there's a, you know, there actually has been a lot of surveilling of the virus. Now we we you know about its genetic code. We're seeing how it's mutating. We know about all the different variants. We know how it moves. We know how it doesn't move. We have a lot more information than we did at the beginning. Um, and and from that perspective, given uh, compared to say SARS, the relatively low level of uh, uh, mortality attached to it compared to things like SARS, uh, the first round of it. Uh, on the one hand, the very high levels of contagion on the other do signal that many of the measures that were taken with regard to physical distancing, uh, hand washing, um, uh, wearing masks, not having lots of folks in the room, uh, were probably reasonable measures. Uh, where I think the fines were problematic was, when, was in the arbitrary way in which many of them were actually needed out. Um, people who were fined in situations where the police clearly had no idea what the legislative basis was of their of their actions. Uh, I actually interviewed two policemen up on Mount Royal here at the beginning of the pandemic as they were ticketing somebody and said, you know, what basis are you? I, I'm, I'm curious. I had my dog with me and my dog was extremely cute and small. And so whenever I approach the police, I always have my dog with me. And, and then they don't get that. And so, and so I said, yeah, I'm really curious. What, what, what statute are you issuing this fine under? Or which bylaw are you operating under? And they looked at me and they stared at their books and they stared at each other and then they stared at their books again and they said, we don't know. And when I subsequently spoke with the communications officer at, 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 at the uh, SPVM, the Société de Montreal Police Force, uh, they said, well, it's, it's not our job. It's, it's not our job. It's not our job to train our officers on these measures that are coming forward. It's really up to the government to say what the rules are, and it is not our job. And he said this publicly as the communications advisor. That is where I have a real problem. Uh, because, because the Kosian case before the Supreme Court of Canada, you all remember that was the handrail case of this woman who was looked down at the handrail and the police went after her. Um, was very clear about the fact that it's the responsibility of the police, A, to know the rules that they're uh, enforcing, and B, to know uh, why it is they're enforcing them, and it's the responsibility of the police force to actually train their own officers, a novel and exciting concept. So if you have an entire police force that is out there managing multiple uh, fines that they are, uh, that are changing on a daily basis and they don't know what they even are, that's where I think there's real, a real opportunity. Uh, to to uh, challenge these rules, but closing words to you, Michael. Any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I you know because I mean we're obviously still in it. We're still in a pandemic. We're living in a pandemic for 
my mask is right here. Uh, and um, I understand why a, a government wouldn't launch a, uh, a review of the way in which it was managed. Um, I call it a postmortem, uh, however you may want to describe it, but an overview of what was what, what we got right, and what we got wrong. And because of the nature of the pandemic, you know, we might will probably be in this for some time. And, and it may feel as if um, it's not over um, in the foreseeable future, which means we won't have that take place. The problem with that is it means that there's, there's no moment when the leadership of, by the bar, by government, by the academy or, or otherwise, okay, now we need to, uh, you know, now, now that the horrible use of the Patriot Act is, is now behind us, says United States um, progressive, let's uh, get to work at getting rid of it. I don't think that's gonna happen in Canada. Uh, because we're not going to, I don't think we're going to have, I don't know if we're going to have that moment. So I guess my, my concluding remarks would be to the bar, uh, to the judiciary, to ministers of justice across the country. And, you know, don't, there's not going to be a time in the future in which it's going to be clear that we need to start correcting um, the systems uh, that, that needs to happen now. And no time like the present that the, particular provincial bar uh, or territorial bar has been um, uh, not participating in pro bono public activity uh, up until now is no reason not to change that tomorrow. So I, I think, uh, I, I would hope that we could get some more jurisprudence through those very specific uh, cases. I couldn't agree more. Um, through judicial review, through applications of judicial review on the exercise of discretion, uh, but which will in turn develop a doctrine, which we still haven't quite articulated, or I haven't rather, that would allow us to say, okay, well, here's how our charter rights operate during a pandemic. We don't know how that is uh, to operate. And so in that sense, really, um, people are to some degree making it up as they go along. And it is that arbitrary, that, it's that arbitrary nature of it that is concerning to me because it means it permits a government out of nowhere to suddenly take a direction that um, does not seem to be grounded uh, in the rule of law, but instead seems to be driven by um, entirely partisan political forces. So there's no time like the present, I guess, is what I would have to say. Um, yeah, lawyers, um, advocate, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's now is the time for us to get to work. Alors, j'en profite pour conclure la session d'aujourd'hui. J'aimerais bien remercier Michael Bryant d'avoir participé dans la session d'aujourd'hui. I also want to thank uh, uh, Davies, Wurgles, and Weinberg for participating and contributing to the session today and thank for your presence today here. It's the first time I've been in the faculty since it started. And um, also very much like to thank, of course, the Civil Liberties, uh, Civil Liberties Association for their support today. Nadine, do you have I think we have questions on Zoom. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought we were told there weren't any. My apologies. We have we have yes, at two thirty. Two thirty. Okay. Okay. Great. Your questions. We have questions. Sorry. So you are. Sorry. We keep going. Thank you so much, Nikki. Uh, the question from the chat: Can you please provide your thoughts on the current travel bans, specifically for foreign nationals and Canadian citizens wanting to leave the country for good and not being able to unless vaccinated, uh, and on the issue of religious exemptions? Thank you. Well, you know, I, this is what I'd say in the theme of this talk, uh, that uh, <clears throat> generally speaking, the approach of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association uh, has been that every uh, limitation on liberty, or in this case, mobility rights, uh, ought to be um, uh, two things, necessary and proportionate. Uh, so by proportionate, what CCLA would say is, uh, if there is a less, um, uh, 
if, 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 there, if, if there is a uh, less restrictive way of uh, addressing the precaution, then that ought to be undertaken. So that's why um, there could be a ladder uh, for mobility rights and re-entering the country, the latter being involving steps, including vaccination, including uh, testing, including quarantine. Uh, you would uh, order them uh, in order of uh, restriction on liberty. And um, you, know, you could, of course, give the uh, alternative to the individual. Um, you know, I'm not vaccinated, uh, therefore I'll get tested. Um, or um, I need to, I'm in a hurry, I don't have time to get the, uh, the test done, I'll quarantine. Uh, and, you know, you might say, how would that come up? Well, in, in the context of a funeral. So the, the, that's what the Newfoundland case is that we're challenging. It involves somebody who was a, considered herself a Newfoundlander. She was living in uh, Nova Scotia she, uh, at the time, working there. She wanted to go home for her mother's funeral. And uh, the answer was, no, you can't go, oh, but I'll quarantine. No, it doesn't matter. Um, but I'll get a test done. No, it doesn't matter. You can't come in. So uh, there was no alternative. It wasn't proportionate. It was just a blanket. No, you can't come in. Uh, so uh, that would be my, the general approach to any of these bans. Uh, and um, you asked about travel bans. And what was the other one? Religious exemptions. Religious exemptions. Yeah, well, I mean, this is an area that hasn't really had been tested beyond failed injunctions. Every injunction that's been brought, uh, that I'm aware of, that's been brought in Canada has failed. Uh, and it, it failed at equity law. It failed at the injunction level, not at the constitutional level. Uh, the, um, the treatment of, and, 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 I'm, you know, and so I don't think that there's been proportionality um, uh, when it comes to uh, the restrictions uh, in the religious institutions. I, frankly, I think that's as cultural as much as jurisprudential. Uh, and um, uh, from the government's perspective, uh, laicite would seem to rule across the country because uh, I think the presumption was that worship in a church or synagogue or mosque uh, would be the same as um, uh, as uh, going to a Walmart. Although actually that's not fair because there's a uh, Walmart and Home Depot and other big boxes did much better than the churches uh, during the pandemic in terms of allowing people in. So, uh, you know, does it does the specific law pass these tests of necessity and proportionality? You know, it depends upon the facts, it depends upon the particular law, and you know, our view would be depending on it that there ought to be alternatives and uh, that the government would have to have uh, empirical evidence that there was a high risk justifying it. Now, in the context of constitutional litigation, are you gonna have that evidence? Uh, and is it gonna make its way through the courts in time to have an impact? Because sometimes these regulations become dated within weeks. Uh, I, to that, I'd say, yeah, no, we don't have a system in Canada that's timely enough to respond uh, with some exceptions, the Montreal curfew being one of them, uh, to uh, efforts to, undertake pandemic litigation. And then there was a second question. Up there, or those were the two together. So in, in Montreal, we had we had uh, challenges that were raised to the uh, Quebec um, provisions dealing with uh, particularly from the Hasidic youth. There were there were several challenges that were brought uh, socially uh, and and through uh, looking at options that were available. And one of the things that was interesting in the Quebec context was around the time that these challenges were brought or these concerns were raised, uh, stores were able to have people in them provided that the store itself had a public exit, uh, for example, in a, in a mall situation or a commercial center situation, provided it was a public exit onto the street. Uh, the comparable situation would not have been permitted for a, a religious uh, a group and and I one wonders without knowing uh, whether the the entire life debate uh, actually ended up affecting what from an epi epidemiological perspective was an identical phenomenon. There, there's no difference between a bunch of people being in uh, uh, Place de Marie and being able to exit uh, from a particular uh, exit 
and somebody being in the synagogue uh, up in, in Plateau Mile Land and being able to exit through a separate, a separate route. And so these kinds of cases were brought forward, I think, as, a, as an example. And Michael used this word earlier, this issue of arbitrariness, and again, proportionality, uh, as being really central to the way in which uh, challenges were brought uh, to these uh, to these types of, of, uh, of restrictions. I, I had a client uh, on, on the movement issue. I had a client uh, somewhat similar to the Newfoundland case, although for different reasons, uh, who, who was up in the Tabiscamay area. And he lived in Quebec and needed to get to Ontario to manage his, uh, he had a chip stand uh, on the highway on the, Ontario, on the Ontario side. And he was being told that he was not allowed to go back home. Or in some cases, go to his work and then, uh, of course, be able to to return back. So, uh, but again, the problem there was communications with the police because the police didn't actually really know what the laws were, and they were afraid that they were going to have their wrists slapped uh, for allowing him to go through the border. And so, there was a fair amount of time spent uh, engaging with the police. We ended up retaining criminal counsel uh, just in terms of the relationship with the police. Um, uh, criminal, uh, you know, police tend to be far more impressed with criminal lawyers than they do with criminal lawyers. So, so we had, we had, uh, you know, a, a team on this simply to get this guy to be able to go to work and to be able to come back home again. And so it was a really, and, and it ended up being fine, but not everybody has access to counsel. Not everybody has access to somebody who knows counsel. So there were, there were access to justice issues during the pandemic that I think were, were, uh, actually quite frightening. And I'd be interested in knowing, Michael, what your experience was at the CCLA in terms of the volume of calls coming in. Because I found as a, as a sole practitioner uh, and somebody who had said, you know, I'm, I'm happy to help people pro bono in certain types of situations, that I was inundated within a few weeks. Uh, and it, I was really surprised at the number of people who simply had nowhere to go and no idea where to go. Yeah. Any thoughts on what happened at the CCLA that was there? Yeah, no, uh, we had the same experience. Uh, and uh, I mean, we were a staff of 10 people, uh, so there's only so much we can do at CCLA. Uh, and uh, we we do rely heavily on uh, pro bono, so pro bono counsel to bring our matters to court. And um, there, and the, um, but finding available counsel uh, was more difficult during COVID uh, for two reasons. One, um, the uh, the high volume of work being under the high volume of legal work being undertaken uh, in the law firms. Right? I mean, I you don't have to nod or not, but most of the law firms in Toronto, sorry, all of the big law firms in Toronto had the best year in their in the history of their firms. Uh, over uh, during COVID, uh, I guess it makes sense. They have clients saying, uh, "How do I comply with the law?" Or I need this regulation changed, or I don't know how this works, and uh, or they have uh, labor law issues, or they have human resources issues. I mean, it was it it's been uh, I don't want to be uh, flippant about it, but it, it it's been positive for the legal industry. Let's put it that way. So uh, lawyers have been busier than ever, ever and more profitable than ever. Uh, and um, at this, and so people were busy, lawyers were busy, and uh, law firms tend not to be uh, overstaffed. So uh, there, that was one. And secondly, uh, certainly criminal lawyers and human rights lawyers were also busy uh, at this time because there was so much, such a high volume of work. But there was also, well, let's put it this way we had some difficulty finding counsel on certain cases, and I suspect it was. Pretty it was because uh, they um, uh, they were <clears throat> concerned about uh, you know, public criticism. So that you did uh, not criminal lawyers, they they and human rights lawyers. They do tend they're used to being martyrs. Uh, but um, uh, even still, uh, we did have some difficulty in uh, in securing counsel uh, during COVID. I was going to say one more thing about the churches, by the way, which I forgot to mention is. That you mentioned the Hasidic community that the um, uh, you know within the Christian churches, the Catholic Church, Anglican Church, United Church, uh, silence um, and uh, uh, the churches that challenge uh, our, our experience in Ontario were the churches 
that did challenge restrictions on um, uh, capacity in places of worship or, or evangelical churches. And um, you and in turn, my experience in Toronto was that the uh, churches themselves uh, had boards more often than not with elderly people who were more likely to be, I would say, pro precautionary than skeptical. And so the churches were quite fine in many cases with uh, Zoom services uh, in Toronto. But that ended up having an impact. And you know, there's all, we don't know what the impacts could be. Uh, of COVID and the restrictions, but you know, one wonders whether, to what extent, suicides, overdoses, hospitalizations, uh, and I'd say addiction relapses uh, were, in fact, it has some causal connection to, say, um, uh, overregulation by governments. We don't know that right now, but I know that the twelve-step community, in essence, got shut down. So AA meetings, NA meetings, and so on, got shut down during COVID because their typical landlord was a church or a synagogue. They were closed. And so that community went online. Uh, and uh, I, I know uh, that many uh, in 12 circuit programs would say uh, that was great for some, but particularly for a newcomer, a lot more difficult to go through um, uh, recovery by Zoom than to do it in person. It's just a completely different experience. Uh, so the impact of the churches was not just as religious leaders, but also as landlords for community events and, you know, homeless drop-ins. You know, often a church would, or a synagogue would host a homeless drop-in. Uh, well, they weren't hosting homeless drop-ins uh, and providing food thereby because they were closed. Uh, so the leadership that I referred to in the bar, uh, I think applies to uh, non-legal institutions as well, uh, such as uh, churches and uh, and uh, synagogues and mosques and uh, be. I, I don't. Uh, and but you know, again, that that may be uh, uh, a much broader issue that has nothing to do with pandemic and everything, just to do with day to day nationally. But um, but but we'll see. And I. I, I um, I'm wondering if that trend will continue. So I, I'd like to ask you a question, which may be unfair to ask you in the, in the last moments of this, of this uh, presentation, because it's a big question, but it, it's one that connects with something I alluded to uh, earlier, which is, which is our, I think, new understanding of um, the relationship and the indivisibility, if I could use international law term, between human rights and among human rights. In a way that I think this pandemic has shown us in a way that I don't think we've ever quite seen before. Uh, and the cl close connections between the right to health, uh, the right to be, the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, the connections with education, uh, union rights, uh, and how they all intermingled with uh, how we get on in our daily lives and seeing that in a much more holistic way. Uh, I know there's always been this historic split uh, in the civil liberties movement in Canada. Uh, perhaps more with the CCLA than with you guys, um, uh, in terms of not engaging with that other piece. But I'd be really interested in knowing from your perspective, given the CCLA's role as, a, I think, a real thought leader uh, in terms of educating the rest of Canada mm -hmm. right, on these issues, uh, how, how do you see this interaction playing out going forward and, and perhaps having an implication or an impact beyond the pandemic alone? I, I think the likelihood of change coming is, is definitely higher today. Uh, and uh, I'll say that our board, for example, at CCLA, is more interested in uh, having something to say about the right to housing, right? And more to say about environmental mediation than it, it was a few years ago, that's for sure. And secondly, the International Network of Civil Liberties Organizations, which CCLA is a member of, so is the ACLU and um, ACRI in Israel, and Liberty in the United Kingdom, uh, uh, there's a 12 of us, uh, is also interested in this. So this change is happening at the same time. 
Um, and I, I wouldn't be surprised to see um, some change uh, for the first time where uh, civil liberties organizations become more about human rights more broadly and less about uh, what I consider to be the shield, you know, more often than not for the shield, uh, trying to intervene or intercept the oppressive state against the uh, individual. Uh, this, of course, is human rights as a sword, um, uh, but also moving into areas that are less obviously um, about negative rights and entirely more positive rights. So I, I think I think we will see some changes, or it's more likely that we'll see some changes. Although there is a practical issue, uh, and that is that it's a it's a very different donor base. And it's a very different support base. So for those organizations, unlike CCLA, that are grant focused, we're not grant focused because we don't seek government money for reasons of because we, we, we feel we need a conflict. So uh, I, I think it will take longer for this change to happen, in part because of the business of how charities and not for profits uh, receive the revenue. Uh, and uh, that's as well. Uh, there's a there's a zero sum aspect to it. So the extent to which civil liberties organizations move into this territory will not be received with much um, uh, welcome by those that are currently um, uh, working in that field and therefore accessing those donors and accessing those grants. So there's a practical aspect to it that I think is real. Question, uh, uh, any recommendations for restaurant owners on the vaccine passports? Is it legal for them to be asking for them or legal to refuse entry to patrons without them? Right. So, uh, I mean, most jurisdictions in Canada, well, sorry, at Quebec and Ontario and uh, BC and, and some other uh, jurisdictions federally have, um, uh, have the laws in place. Uh, finding them is not easy, uh, although. Um, if you, I, I would have, I'd say, and maybe this isn't fair, but if you know where to look, you can access the uh, Quebec regulations. It's, it, I found that it wasn't easier to find it, and to easier to find it, for example, as it was to find uh, uh, legislation online uh, in Quebec. But um, uh, in your own province, it, it will be there in writing, and there will be some guidance online. Uh, you know, if uh, the restaurant can afford counsel, they'll probably be retaining a law firm to give them the answer to that. Uh, and, um, you know, we have a situation in Canada now where some restaurants uh, will do more than they were doing. Uh, so we'll do more than is required under the regulation. And by and large, in most jurisdictions, this is permissible. Because remember, before these regulations came into place around vaccine mandates, it was already open to businesses to, um, in essence, develop their own criteria. Uh, no shoes, no shirt, no service, no vaccine mandate. You don't get served. Businesses can turn people away, provided that they don't violate the human rights codes. Now what's happened is they have specific legal authorization and a legal requirement uh, in some cases, depending on the jurisdiction to uh, uh, to require that uh, information to be brought about. But I've been in restaurants which uh, does more than that. They will ask for the vaccine passport and ask for the proof of it. Uh, and in addition to that, they'll contact Trace and get your information. And I, and, and you know, and get my information and in essence get me to say, yeah, I'm not sick. Uh, they pre screen. Uh, the, because the restaurants that that's happened to me, I suspect that's because their law firm has told them to do it in the name of class action liability, uh, as opposed to um, uh, based on some uh, broader public health concern around their clientele's um, public health, but I could be wrong. And, uh, and, it, and that, it'll be interesting to see to what extent consumers say, I don't like that. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't like going to that restaurant because I, I got to spend an extra five minutes at the front of the restaurant providing my information. I don't think I, I should do that. That's certainly not happening right now that I'm aware of in Canada. 
So one of the things I think is really interesting about your earlier point about the United States is that vaccine mandates are something close to them of existence since the late 19th century in the United States. Yeah. Um, and, and so I find this very interesting juxtaposition of the Americans imposing, I mean, New York State, for example, is a great one, uh, imposing vaccine mandates on an across the board basis, uh, very little opposition in terms of everyday uh, life. My daughter's at the University of NYU now, and it's just a fact of life. You have to be vaccinated. Uh, and you do have this long tradition of, of vaccine mandates. Uh, but on the other hand, this much larger level of, of challenge going up to the appellate courts compared to Canada, where there's much more, I think, upheaval on the ground, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps less uh, uh, at, at the higher level. So. Let's do this one more time. Any closing thoughts, Michael? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what well, you know? What? Why don't we? Uh, uh, my closing thought will be an answer to a closing question. Um, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Sure. Sorry. So, uh, no, no uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I just had a quick question related back to the original comments you had on surveillance and things like that. And specifically, the example that came to mind um, was in Ontario. The board had passed or attempted to pass some sort of measure where. People could be stopped on the streets mm. automatically um, with kind of no um, kind of warning, and that you would have to comply. And in that circumstance, Toronto police officers said they wouldn't comply with the measure. Barry police officers said they wouldn't comply with the measure. I think CCLA just ran to put their files together um, to complain or uh, pass a motion on part. Yeah. yeah, to file a complaint. Um, but because um, civil society actors came together and basically manifested some sort of communal veto, um, Doug Ford himself apologized to the general public. And I guess in that context, I'm kind of um, interested in what, how you see the role of civil society actors in upholding the rule of law in a circumstance in which we have zero Supreme Court cases. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, it was a, a memorable weekend for me. Uh, and uh, we, we like to think that because the council we retained was so formidable, uh, Doug Ford just rolled over. Uh, we had retained, we announced that we were filing on Monday, we were getting the materials together to bring a challenge uh, to the provision, which amongst other things uh, allowed uh, police or bylaw officers to stop someone without reasonable or probable cause and ask for identification and questioning uh, pre-arrest. And uh, uh, so CCLA says it's all thanks to us, uh, but uh, what was extraordinary was uh, that police chiefs and police unions uh, indicated that they, in the contrary, indicated that they, that they were not gonna comply, that they were not going to uh, be stopping people and asking people for this. Uh, and uh, this arguably was um, part of the police reconciliation that's been taking place since George Floyd's death and a sense from police uh, in Ontario that um, community relations matters to us. And you know, you're basically legalizing parting by doing this. And we don't want to be a part of that. Uh, uh, I that kind of came out of nowhere for me. I hadn't realized that that's where police chiefs and uh, unions had landed, but that's where they landed last spring. Uh, and uh, you're right; the outrage was palpable. Uh, they would people would have reached out to the constituency offices. The part about the order that actually may have turned the tide was. Uh, they also he also included that no all playgrounds will be closed so uh you know i think a lot of families with young kids had already had the experience of lockdowns everybody had come to see that outdoor play was safe and fine and so uh, i could tell you on our staff we have a lot of um moms with young kids uh and not from a principled perspective, but from a practical perspective. That's the one that made them the most furious. What am I going to do with my kids if my school's closed and the playgrounds are closed? Um, that's uh, a recipe for uh, um, serious confinement. So uh, the response, shockingly, over civil liberties um, was that the government changed its mind. So, you know, there are opportunities 
occasionally uh, for small victories. But that one, again, it's a real victory uh, for human rights, I think. But um, uh, I, 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 I think it's reflective of how arbitrary uh, the policies have been at times that, that you know, a premier can out of nowhere say, we're going to uh, go from being um, uh, small L liberal about our pandemic restrictions to strict overnight and then go back two days later. Um, and uh, at no point was there an assessment, well, is this necessarily proportionate? That wasn't driving it through, which leads me to my last point, I guess, as I'll say to my uh, former club, the Attorneys General of uh, the provinces, territories of Quebec, uh, that I, I think in some provinces and territories, the Attorneys General have been asleep at the switch and not asserting themselves in cabinet and not asserting themselves throughout the government to try and demand some level of necessity proportionality in other levels of government. Uh, they have been certainly, you know, you could imagine Lamenti has uh, been as active as one can be uh, within that government. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that those attorneys general need to be held to account on the constitutional performance, if you like, of their governments, because that's their job to do that. Uh, which is part of the leadership that I spoke of before. And we expect them, they are literally by statute required to uphold the rule of law in their provinces. And so one would hope and want and expect them to do that in each of their jurisdictions. And uh, so we're watching you, Attorneys General of Canada, uh, to make sure you're doing your job. I'm almost afraid to say this, but I think this is it. Uh, unless, unless there is anything, any questions from the floor or from the chat, I think we are going to wind up. Uh, so thanks very much once again, Michael, for being here. Oh, Absolutely uh, fascinating. <laughs>